Good morning. Wow, it's good to see all of you again. Thank you for having me back. I mean that sincerely. Um, sometimes I go to visit relatives and I'm not sure I'm going to be invited back. So it's, <laughs> it's always good to see people inv invite you back. I did just get back from Kenya, and if there's one thing I know this morning, it's this. There is a nap in my future, <laughs> but it won't be for a while. Um, I do greet you this morning, so let me do that properly. Jumbo, uh, which means hello in Swahili, and that's about it. So that, that, I know a few more things, like thank you. Uh, I had 27 inmates in the Thika prison teach me how to say praise the Lord in Swahili. Buona Asafare, and uh, they just could not get over that a Mazungu, that means a white guy, would be that interested in trying to learn Swahili. It is an exciting thing to go to Kenya. Uh, there is no doubt about that. Uh, Jim Roselle and myself, I think we've been there now maybe, golly, I guess it's almost eight times. And it's, uh, it's such a wonderful place to be, and here's why. You know, one time... Uh, America looked upon Africa as being the dark continent. Let me share with you, it is no longer dark. And the light of Christ is brightly shining. As a matter of fact, if it were not for our brothers and sisters in Africa, the American church in some denominations would actually be in worse shape than they are today. When it comes to general councils and annual meetings and votes, it's been the African church, at least the African church, along with even the Asian church, that has held America's denominational feet to the fire when it comes to solid issues, inerrancy of scripture, the authority of God's word, the full sovereignty of God, especially as it expressed in the substitutionary atonement of the Lord Jesus Christ and all that God has created. We can praise God for the Kenyan church, and I hope you will pray for them. They do send you their greetings. Uh, they are so grateful. They are, because they realize that as a church in Africa, they have also been blessed by so much uh, that happens through, through America. So, so thank you, and can, would you pray for the Kenyan church? Pray for all of the church in Africa. That does not mean that they are not without their difficulties and challenges. There are many, they are many, but in what I understand probably from last week with Pastor Holman and the truth that we share with them this week, regardless of whatever we see going on in our world and around us, this much we know is true. Jesus Christ is building his church. That will never be stopped. That is a promise from the Lord Jesus Christ. In the same way, I will continue to pray for you because I know the Lord's gonna continue to build this church right here in Richmond, Indiana with your next pastor, be praying for you, for the committee that the Lord will bring you in his time, and I know he will. Just the right man to lead you and to continue to build upon what others have done faithfully in this church, proclaiming the gospel for years. You are a light to Richmond, Indiana, and I thank you for your presence here and your commitment to God's truth in your lives. So I say that sincerely and for having me here with you this morning. Now, having done all of that, um, we can be finished because Donna Girdley did a great job. So we're done, no. <laughs> Actually, the last time I was here, I said something about Donna Girdley, and I just love sharing about her anyway, because I'll hear about this too. But she said, wow, Bob, thanks for running, me, running over me with the bus. And I said, well, Donna, it's just that I know you, and I know your heart, and it's easy to share about you. And uh, as, I, as we saw here today, her love for children is evidenced in this church as well as uh, the school here in town, Community Christian School. Donna Girdley has given of her heart and her life to them for years. And Donna, children who are now adults, bless your name because of that as we do. So thank you, sister. Thank you for your love for Christ and his children. And if you wanted to applaud right there, that would be fine, I think. He's read the scripture for you, but if you want to take your Bibles uh, and just turn with me to Psalm 25, um, it is, it, it's really more of a headline verse because we'll be looking at others today. So Psalm 25, and I'm just going to read that for you 
uh, very quickly one more time as you're turning to it. Um, 2511. For your name's sake, O Lord, pardon my guilt. For it is great. Um, 1973, I was in the United States Navy. Man, that's a long time ago. Um, but in 1973 particularly, something very significantly happened to me in my life. I got mixed up with a group of men in the Navy called the Navigators. And if any of you know anything about the Navigators, um, the first thing they want to make sure you know how to do is to memorize Scripture. I'll never forget one of the moments when that came true in my life. We were getting together to play a football game. And uh, Paul Fritz, a man who was frail looking to me and lean, and he was standing against me. Uh, we were going to play two-hand tag, but uh, he was going to rush and I was going to defend. And uh, we got down on the ground and we got in our stance. And Paul Fritz looked at, up to me and he says, hey, Bob, guess what? I said, what? There can be no forgiveness of sin without the shedding of blood. <laughs> and Paul Fritz took me to the cleaners. <laughs> we learned the first five verses. They're called the assurance verses. How many of you know those assurance verses? Just out of curiosity from a navigator ministry. Anybody? Assurance of salvation. Assurance of answer prayer. John, I'm sorry, I should back up because they, 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 want, they would want me to, to do this. Assurance of salvation, 1 John 5, 11 and 12. Assurance of answer prayer, John 16, 24. Assurance of victory, 1 Corinthians 10, 13. Assurance of forgiveness, 1 John 1, 9. Assurance of guidance, Proverbs 3, 5 and 6. Assurance verses. Because in the new Christian's life, if there's one thing they need, it's assurance. Assurance of their salvation. Assurance that God will hear and answer their prayer. Assurance that they can overcome temptation. Assurance that God will forgive them. And then following on that, an assurance that God's going to guide them in life. But you know what? It's just not the new Christian that needs to have that assurance. 30 years, over 30 years of pastoral ministry with other people. But let me just not use that. Let me also say in my own life, if there's an area where people truly struggle, it's in the area of the assurance of forgiveness. Donna Girdley shared the I, I won't mention you too many more times, Donna. I promise, okay? Donna shared that uh, one of her nice little tidy tricks was to push stuff under the bed. And I think for many of us, because of things in our past and things that we have done, uncertain of God's complete and lasting forgiveness leave things under the bed for far too long and we go through life uncertain about God's love for us we meet people and they shake our hands and they hug us and we say hello and that we love them but in our heart of hearts, we know that if they knew what I know about myself, they'd run me out of this church. That's not true for all of you here. But it's true for at least one person here this morning. It's me. It's me. I've lived that life. I've lived that life wondering... God, I don't know. I know you forgave me for all of those sins, but you know, when I think on this one, I, do you, did you really? Did, did you cover that one? Jesus, is it really, 
is it paid for? Not too long ago in my reading, my, my Bible reading, I was going through the Old Testament, went through Isaiah, then I went through Ezekiel, and there was something that kept popping up. And I saw it again in Psalm 25. And it is this, and it leads me to this. If I really want to know and experience God's lasting forgiveness, love in my life, there are two things I must do. What's so funny is that right now, people who really know me would say, Bob, really just two? Are you sure it's not three? Because every pastor has three points. I only have two this morning. Here they are. The first one is this. I must deal honestly with the depth of my sin. And secondly, I must trust solely in the delight of God's worth. That's it. And we see that in Psalm 25 so, so clearly. Pardon my sin. God, pardon it for your namesake because my guilt is great. So let's, do, let's deal with the first point. If I must, deal, I must deal honestly with the depth of my sin. And if I'm going to do that, if I'm going to deal honest with, honestly with my sin, it's going to involve two things. Here's the first one. Recognition. Recognition. Now, this is more than a mere reflection of something I've done wrong, something misguided. It's both an inward and outward recognition that I am first and foremost a sinner. A sinner saved by grace. Notice what he says. My guilt, the phrase my guilt may be ambiguous in sort of its nature in that it doesn't name a specific sin. And we know if there's anybody who could name specific sins, it was David. But there is something else. Though the phrase my guilt may be ambiguous in its nature, the what of the guilt or sin, it is completely unambiguous regarding the who. David says, it's my sin. He's willing to own it. He knows that it's his. So much so that David will say, my sin is great. How does he know that? The course that I taught this last time in Kenya was on the Pentateuch, the Torah, the first five books of our Old Testament. Do you know how many laws, now I ask this question, I know you all know this because you're a great congregation. Do you know how many laws there are in the Pentateuch? 613. 613. Which one did David have in mind? It's kind of like sin de jour or a la carte. In other words, if sin were a dartboard, and sometimes it's talked of that way, you could throw a dart and you would find a sin there in God's law. I don't have time, obviously, to go into the Pentateuch, but let me simply say this. The law of the Pentateuch was never to try to form Israel into a legislative group of people. It was to demonstrate them God's great love for them. The law was supposed to lead them to love. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Deuteronomy 6.6, 6, the first great commandment. But David knows that within all of the cataloging of God's sin, all 613, that he is a sinner and that his sin is great. And how does he really know that? Well, because David is not using himself as the measuring rod, as the standard of righteousness. He's not like the Pharisee who stands next to the tax collector, is he? And says, God, I thank you. I'm not like him. And the him was the Pharisee who was face down and beating himself and said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. David knows his sin is great because of God's objective standard of his truth and of God's own measuring stick of righteousness, not self-righteousness, 
but the righteousness that can only come from God. And David knows that to recognize his sin, to own his sin, goes further. It is to say about my sin what God says about my sin. No euphemism, no changing of words to soften it. The verse that I learned so many years ago, a oh, long time ago, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Amen. That word confess in the Greek is a very interesting word. It's the Greek homologos. It means same word, same thing. In other words, when I confess my sin, I'm willing to say about my sin what God says about my sin. And anything less than that is not recognizing sin for what it is. We'll see an example of that in a little bit. The people always try to minimize their sin instead of simply saying, this is it. David recognizes that. And the only thing he'd say about his guilt is that his guilt was great. The first part is recognition. The second part, if we're going to deal honestly with our sin, is this. We must acknowledge that there's absolutely nothing that any of us can do about our sins. I can't make it go away. And by the way, simply saying you're sorry is not dealing with your sin. Forgiveness involves an acknowledgement that God must forgive my sin and along with that is going to come repentance where I turn and I go away from my sin. When we sin against God, it's not simply a matter of saying, God, I'm sorry. When we say we're sorry to God, that is such a small view of who God is. God is a holy and completely righteous God who will not let the guilty go unpunished, his word tells us. We must appeal to God in who he is. So appropriately, David says, Yahweh, using O Lord, or in that case, it may have been Jehovah or Adonai, because that Tetragrammaton, that four-letter word of God, Yahweh, was not spoken by the people of God. But David says, oh Lord, pardon, pardon my guilt. Why does David say that? Because David is worn down. If you want to see a complete picture of David and what happens to him and his sin and how he deals with it, you have in the very front of your church two banners from Psalm 51. Well, we don't have time to turn there today, but if you did, you would see a man who is completely consumed by the guilt of his sin and doesn't know where else to turn except God. And praise God, he doesn't leave David in that state because he sends to him his prophet Nathan. Nathan, a gift of God, Nathan. And God gives a gift to David of being able to confess his sin and to be reconciled to him. Why is that important? Because David knew what Isaiah knew in 59 too. But your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God and his sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear Forgiveness as a concept in Christian theology has its origin really in Old Testament theology. There are three Hebrew words that mean to forgive and really we concentrate on two of the most frequently used. Nasa, which I remembered in Hebrew class because it was N-A-S-A -A, and it means to lift up or to remove or take away and that was easy for me. I needed a mnemonic device in Hebrew, trust me. You want to know about God's grace? It's getting through Hebrew at seminary. That was God's grace to me. And my wife is here and she can tell you that. There were too many all-nighters with Hebrew. But the second word for it, forgiveness is salak. And that's the word that's used here. 
to pardon. You'll find it throughout the Old Testament and carry over even into New Testament words as well. But the word in Hebrew, salak, is a word that is only used of God's forgiveness to us. It is not a word that is used between individual and forgiveness takes place and is transacted. Salak is a word that is used in a vertical representation between God and the penitent, the one who is seeking pardon. It's described for us in a variety of ways, not just by word, but by word picture. I'm just going to read these for you and you can jot them down if you, if you would like to. But Isaiah 38, 17, Behold, it was for my welfare that I had great bitterness, but in love you have delivered my life from the pit of destruction, for you have cast all my sins behind your back. Isn't that a wonderful word picture? In, it's nice to know that things really are in the rearview mirror of our lives. David put it this way in Psalm 103, as far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. Jeremiah, in the writing of the new covenant that's about to come, says this. Jeremiah 31, 34, and no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother saying, know the Lord, for they shall all know me. For the least of them to the greatest declares the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquities and I will remember their sins no more. Isaiah 55, 7, let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord that he may have compassion on him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. And then from the prophet Micah 7, 18 and 19, who is a God like you? Who? is a God like you, pardoning iniquity and passing over transgression for the remnant of his inheritance. He does not retain his anger forever because he delights, he delights himself in steadfast love. He will again have compassion on us. He will tread our iniquities underfoot. You will cast all of our sins into the depths of the sea. God is an amazing God. He's a forgiving God. But we must deal honestly with our sins. We don't think of them lightly. We don't try to coin a new phrase for them. Adultery is still adultery. That's all it is. We're in a culture now where we're using words like same sex attracted. We're going to develop a whole new vocabulary, but this is one thing we must know. When it comes to the lexicon of sin, we must use God's definitions and not ours. Now, that does not mean that we do not have compassion for the sinner because God has had compassion on us. And of the 613, I'm convinced because of my life, there's probably 615 that I have ways I've offended God. My sins are too numerous to count. If God did keep a record, I would not stand before you today if I were not convinced of God's absolute and complete and eternal forgiveness, I could not stand behind this pulpit and preach. Could not. We must deal honestly with our sin because we have an honest God. But that leads me to the second point in the sermon. If I must deal honestly with my sin, and I realize that I must acknowledge my sin before God because he's the only one who can deal with my sin sufficiently. Then secondly, I must trust solely in the delight of God's worth. You know, there's nothing more unnerving than to do your research on your sermon and to finally go on the internet and to find out that John Piper or someone else has already written on this. 
you're thinking, oh, I had an original thought. No, not really. And of course, John Piper has written some great things. I have a quote from him that I'll read to you in just, in just a bit. But, but please notice from the text in Psalm 25, 11. Let me just turn back to that with you one more time. For your name's sake, O Yahweh, pardon my guilt, for it is great. And then from 1 John 2, 12 is as uh, Donna read for the, the children. I am writing to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven for his name's sake. David implores here and says, for your name's sake, O Lord. For your name's sake. You see, it was in my reading of the Old Testament that I saw something that I had not seen for over 50 years of walking with Jesus. I'll tell you what it is right now and then we'll get to it later. If God does not forgive you, his name, his honor, his glory is on the line. If God ever goes back on his word, Simply put, he is not God. And David knows that because of his relationship with Yahweh. And so David knows that the highest appeal that he can make is to the name Yahweh, the name that Moses learns of God from the burning bush. For you see, when Moses is going to go back to Egypt, he's a little concerned. You know, God, they're going to see me. And I'm going to tell them that the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob sent me. But I, I have a hunch. I, I just have a hunch. They're going to want to know, well, who is he? What is his name? What am I going to tell them? And God says, here's what you tell them. I am who I am. That is my name. And you see, that is the script of God in his essence, of who he is in his being. And David knows that. And we all know that David could certainly appeal because he wrote of it throughout the Psalms. He could appeal to God's compassion, to his goodness, to his love to his steadfast love, to his chesed love, that covenantal love. There were so many things that David could have appealed to regarding the attributes of God, his holiness, his righteousness. But David groups all of those together and he goes to the very top one. He says, God, for your name's sake, for who you are in your being, pardon my iniquity. Pardon my guilt, for it is great. Isaiah 48, 9 through 11. Turn there with me, would you, for just a moment? Isaiah, you're not too far. Isaiah 48, 9 through 11. Listen to these words from, from God's truth. Let them, let them sink in deeply. For my name's sake, I defer my anger. For the sake of my praise, I restrain it for you that I may not cut you off. Behold, I have refined you, but not as silver. I have tried you in the furnace of affliction. For my own sake, for my own sake, I do it. For how should my name be? be profaned. My glory I will not give to another. Do you see all of the repetition there and all of the things that just continue to flow? It's my sake. It's my name. It's my own sake. It's my glory. It's my praise. And God acts on that basis. 
As Piper will teach us, as he sees in this verse and so many other places, God is most uniquely and ultimately concerned for the glory of his own honor. And he does all things for his glory and that it may be maintained throughout the nations. And it is that glory of God, it is the sake of God that David appeals to so uniquely here. It, it, it goes on. I'm going to read these for you. Isaiah 43, 25. I, I am he who blots out your transgressions. For my own sake, I will not remember your sins. Psalm 79, 8 through 10. Do not remember against us our former iniquities. Let your compassion come speedily to meet us, for we are brought very low. Help us, O God of our salvation, for the glory of your name. Deliver us and atone for our sins for your name's sake. Why should the nation say, where is their God? Let the avenging of the outpoured blood of your servants be known among the nations before our very eyes. Turn with me, if you would, to Numbers chapter 14. I'd like to illustrate this for you. You know, it's great. I'm glad I was in the Pentateuch this week because so many of these verses come to mind. But Numbers chapter 14 those of you who have been through the Old Testament, who have been through the, the Pentateuch, if you will, know the stories well, and you know that this story, chapter 14, is in direct response to the people rebelling against God. That will, in fact, cost them 40 years of wilderness journey. Look with me at verse 11. And the Lord said to Moses, how long will this people despise me? How long will they not believe in me? In spite of all the things, the signs that I have done for them, I will strike them with pestilence and disinherit them. And I will make of you a nation greater and mightier than they. You know, God does have his breaking point, if I can put it in that kind of human terminology. We see it in scripture. We see it back in Genesis 5 and 6 when the condition of man is so horrendous to God that he's going to blot them out. And he grieves that he even made man because the inclination of his heart is always wicked. We get to Genesis 10 and 11, the Tower of Babel, and we see it again. And God scatters the nations. And here he raises up Israel and he brings them out of bondage of Egypt. And the Lord says to Moses, how long will these people despise me? Why don't they believe in me? He says, I've had it with them. I'm going to wipe them out, Moses. I will start over with you again. And Moses, Moses, that shadow and type for us of the Christ who is to come and who we see even in John 17 in the high priestly prayer of Jesus, Moses intercedes. Look with me what follows. But Moses said to the Lord, basically, Lord, if you do this, then the Egyptians will hear of it. For you brought up this people in your might from among them and they will tell the inhabitants of this land they have heard that you, O Yahweh, the name that the Lord gave Moses, that you, O Yahweh, are in the midst of this people. For you, O Lord, are seen face to face and your cloud stands over them and you go before them in a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. Now, if you kill this people as one man, then the nations who have heard of your fame will say, it is because the Lord was not able to bring this people into the land that he swore to give to them, that he has killed them in the wilderness. And now please let the power of the Lord be great as you have promised saying, oh, the Lord is slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, forgiving iniquity and transgression. 
but he will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation. Now look at the words that he used. Please pardon the iniquity. Pardon the iniquity of the people according to the greatness of your steadfast love, just as you have forgiven this people from Egypt unto now. You see, Moses knows that all along, when God says, how long will this people despise me? Moses knows that God has continued to forgive them over and over and over and over again. Do you ever wonder what God does when you just keep doing the same sin over and over and over again? Do you get to that place where you say, there's no, there's no way he's going to forgive it one more time. My, my dance card is full. There's no way that he's going to pardon again. And then we're reminded of the lesson of Jesus and Peter. Lord, how many times should I forgive my brother? And basically Jesus says, don't keep count. May I ask you a question? How do you deal when people continually sin against you? Do you continue to forgive as God continues to forgive you? The Lord's Prayer, and forgive us our sins as we forgive others. What we see here is Moses interceding, and he is appealing. And here's again what he's saying. Lord, if you do this, Though you may be justified in doing so, the nations are going to talk. They're going to ridicule you and everything about you. They're going to say that you can't keep a promise. They're going to say that the people were too overwhelming for you. And you did not have the strength. You did not have the wherewithal. You did not have the compassion and the love to bring them up and to take them from Egypt and to finally put them in the promised land. They're gonna talk about you, God, and they're going to destroy your name and your fame. God, is that what you want? Moses may have been meek, but in his humility, and in his meekness, he has a boldness that allows him to go to God and to intercede for the sake of these people. It is an amazing thing to see. And so for Moses, for David, it is an appeal to God's very essence, his name, his glory, his power, his might, his word. Webster's Dictionary says that sake has to deal with and that it conveys the idea of an end or a purpose. And so when David says, for your sake, or when Moses says, for your fame, for your sake, or when Micah will say it, or when Isaiah will say it, or when another psalmist will say it, what they're saying is this, God, God, for the very end and purpose of all who you are and what you are doing, God, lay that on the line and forgive us. And he does. For the sake of his worth and who he is. Earlier, I read for you that God says that I will remember their sins no more. That's a little bit tricky. Because... Can God really forget something? Can an all-knowing, all-powerful, all-present God actually forget something? Because you see, if he's all-knowing, he would have to remember that he forgot it. I know that sounds confusing, and you're thinking I didn't get enough sleep. Actually, that happened to me once in Dallas. I stayed up all night, we had a new church, 
and myself along with another man, we built the stage for the new church. I got home in time to shower, and I usually led the introduction part of the service, uh, which usually meant I was allowed to help the people uh, understand that they had sinned, and, I would, and we would lead them into a confession of their sins. I don't know what happened that morning to me in Dallas, but I remember the senior pastor getting up, putting his arm around me and say, folks, Bob's been up all night. We're gonna let him sit this one out. <laughs> I don't know what I said. It must not have been good. God cannot forget our sins. In Hebrew, what that word and that connotation of remembering our sins means this. And actually, I think this is a better picture than simply forgetting them and not remembering them. God means, I'm never going to bring this up again. I will never remember your sin before you again. When I say it is done, it is done. You know what this sounds like, don't you? Well, I know that God can forgive me, but I just can't forgive myself. There is no chapter and verse that will ever tell you that God wants us to think that way. God never asks you to forgive yourself. God asks you to enter into his forgiveness of you because it is complete, it is final, and it is eternal. And if it's done, it's done. Don't bring something up in your life that God won't bring up. Don't do that to yourself. That is what Satan wants you to do. He wants you to remain in this guilt of your sin and in the shame of your sin and to show you how deeply God is interested in you and us and everyone when he does this. He walks in the garden in the cool of the day and he cries out, Adam, where are you? Oh, I hid myself. I hid myself because I'm naked. I know it. And I'm ashamed. God does not want you to hide behind a rock or a tree or somewhere else. He wants you to know that for the very sake of his name, he forgives you. Listen to these words. I told you I was going to give you a quote from John Ch Ch Piper, and here it is. The, uh, the righteousness of God is the infinite zeal and joy and pleasure that he has in what is supremely valuable, namely his own perfection and worth. And if he were ever to act contrary to this eternal passion for his own, own perfections. He would be unrighteous. He would be an idolater. And if I may add, and who could ever perfect on John, but I would simply say this to John Piper, and it also means he cannot be God. If God does not forgive your sins completely, God is not God. And his son, Jesus Christ, died in vain. And when Jesus said on the cross, it is finished, he must have meant it's almost finished. But that is not what he said. We turn to 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2, because here's where we see the tie-in to God's name. I want you to put your finger there in 1 John 2. I know it's hard to find. I'm flipping through the pages myself right now. Those pages are so thin towards the back of your Bible. 1 John 2, 12. Now, when you get there, put your finger there. Put your finger right there, okay? Turn to John 17. John 17. Uh, 
All right, now let's read 1 John 2. 1 John 2, 12. That's why God gives you all these fingers. I'm writing to you little children because your sins are forgiven for his namesake. Whose namesake? The Lord Jesus Christ. Turn with me to John, uh, John 17. Look with me closely at verses 11 and 12. And I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. God forgives you for the namesake of Jesus Christ. We are forgiven because of Jesus' sake. And if Jesus does not forgive us, then everything that he has done for us on our behalf, his perfect and passive obedience to God, that would make him the righteous and perfect unblemished lamb that could be before God is our substitute. All of that is in vain, and it is not true. When you wonder if you're truly forgiven, you need look no further than the cross of Jesus Christ. It was complete. I know it is difficult sometimes to believe that grace can be that amazing, but it is. Dear friend, God's name is on the line for you. In Genesis 15, God meets up with Abram. He initiates a covenant and he takes carcasses of animals and he fillets them and he lays them side by side. And then God, through the smoking pot, passes through those animal carcasses. Now, normally, when that kind of a ceremony was done, both parties of the covenant would walk through together, which means that if either one of the parties of the covenant failed to keep their obligation, failed to keep their word, let it be done to me as it is to these animals. But Abram never passes through the carcasses. Only God does. And God says, Abram, this covenant, it's all on me. It's on me. And when God says he forgives you, dear brother and sister in Christ, what God is saying is this. My name is on the line for you. Before the entire watching world, don't worry about what they say about you or think about you. Because I'm on the line for you, Bob. I will never go back on my word for you. And if I may borrow a very simple and far too irreverent cliche, from my own childhood. Cross my heart and hope to die. Do you remember the rest? Stick a needle in my eye. The God of the universe says, my name is on the line for your forgiveness. And I want you to know that. I meditated on this so much while I was in Kenya because it helps me to understand that I am truly forgiven and I don't need to go underneath the bed and drag things out anymore. And neither do you. Because of the blood of Jesus Christ, the eternal covenant, it's done. Remember what Numbers twenty three nineteen says. It's so interesting. Numbers 23, 19 actually comes from the mouth of Balaam. In one of the oracles where Balak 
had asked him to curse the nation of Israel. And he couldn't because God wouldn't let him. All he could do was bless Israel. And here's what Balaam says. God is not a man that he should lie, nor the son of man that he should repent. Has he spoken? And will he not do it? Or has he said, and, we will, and he, will he not fulfill it? God's not a liar. He keeps his promises. There was another time in my life when I was dealing with something like this. And interestingly enough, another answer came from me, came to me while I was in Africa. I'd like to close the sermon with this passage today. I want you to know that God's worth, who he is, is all in for you. God is all in for you. Turn with me to Zephaniah chapter 3. I know you know these words and you've heard them before. But why should we take delight in God's worth? Why should we revel in grace and celebrate his love in our life? Because that's what God is doing for you when he looks at you and he knows that you are forgiven. Zephaniah 3, 17, the Lord, Yahweh, Yahweh your God is in your midst. And by the way, that is the theme of the Bible, God with his people. The Lord, your God is in your midst, the mighty one who will save he will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. He will exalt over you with loud singing. When you confess your sins and the God of all the universe, the judge of all the earth who will do right, how does he respond to your confession how does he respond to you calling upon his name to say, God, I am trusting you to forgive my sins because your name is on the line. How does he respond? He sings over you loudly. He rejoices over you because you belong to him. Because in Jesus Christ, you are kept in the very name of God. God has placed his name on you. And you are called child of God, eternally loved by your Father in heaven. Dear friends, you are forgiven in Christ for all eternity. It will never come up again. Let's pray. Father God, for a grace that's too amazing to really comprehend or understand. For those of us who struggle with the understanding, do, do you really forgive? Father, help us to remember that your name is on the line. Your very character, your essence, your being stands before all of the universe because we have an accuser. We have an accuser of the brethren who would love to say to you, do you see that sin again, God? They did it again. How can you forgive them? But oh God, you do. And you forgive over and over and over again. But oh God, help us never to presume upon your grace Help, help us never to become lazy in our diligence to seek you and your truth. To not only know that we're named by you, but that we would carry in our own being the essence of your name and who you are as your children. Father, help us to delight in who you are. To delight in in all of your worth because we are so worthy to you now in Christ. 
In his name we pray. Amen. We're about to close with a song. I, I'd ask if we could sing this. It's a song that I know is dear to all of you. It's especially dear to me. When you get to these lines, sing it with such clarity and love. The bliss, oh, the bliss of this glorious thought. My sin, not in part, but the whole, is nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, oh, my soul. It is well with our souls. Thank you for being so attentive. I pray that the Holy Spirit has done so much more than I've prepared for you. Thank you for praying that I wouldn't fall asleep during my sermon. <laughs>